Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Lindsay Adams, and as Michael said, I'm the marketing manager for the QC product range here within Randox. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Um, hopefully next time we can be with you in person. Uh, but it's my pleasure to be with you. And over the next 30 to 40 minutes, um, I want to discuss the use of QC software to identify um, any performance issues. So really just following on from what Stephen has already presented um, in terms of EQA, um, we'll look at how we can use data management packages and our QC to look at this on a more real-time basis. There we go. Um, okay, so just over the next 30 minutes, we'll look at why um, it's important to implement a QC software and some of the advantages that a QC software can bring to your laboratory. We'll also touch on some of the regulatory requirements. Uh, so what do ISO 15189 state in relation to um, data management? We'll look at some specific performance metrics and again, how they can help to improve laboratory efficiency. And then finally, we'll introduce some tools to assist the review process, in particular 24-7. And we'll do a quick walkthrough of the software, highlighting some of the key reports and key charts that will actually help you to improve the identification of any trends, bias, system errors, and of course, help you to improve uh, laboratory efficiency. Okay, so first up, why implement a QC software or a data management package? Um, most laboratories um, will come to me saying that they already participate in EQA or proficiency testing, or that they already use their LIMS or the QC software on board their analyzer. So some people don't see the benefit of an additional piece of software, but really there are quite a lot of benefits that um, we can offer on top of what you're already using in the laboratory. So not only will a QC software provide a method of tracking QC results and managing daily QC activities, it will do that for all of your instruments, all of your laboratory analyzers on one centralized platform. On top of that, um, unlike any LIMS or uh, LIS, um, it will also deliver peer group updates. And Stephen's already touched on the importance of peer data in um, facilitating faster troubleshooting and identification of QC failures, and also helping with that root cause analysis. So you can quite quickly see if an error is unique to your laboratory, or perhaps it's something other labs using the same QC and the same instrument are already using. And finally then, it will quickly and easily calculate um, not only your basic QC statistics, so things like your standard deviation and CV, but also some more advanced metrics. And we're gonna to touch on some of those advanced metrics this morning. Um, and most importantly, that's gonna to help to improve detection of any trend or bias. And as we'll go through the presentation, you'll see how that might actually improve your QC strategy design as well. Okay, so touching on the regulatory requirements and specifically uh, ISO 15189. So in relation to data management, they state that the lab shall have a procedure to prevent the release of patient results in the event of a QC failure. So in other words, when the QC rules are violated or indicate that the examination results are likely to contain a clinically significant error, the results should be rejected. And they also go on to say that QC data shall be reviewed at regular intervals to detect trends in examination performance. So how will a data management package or a QC software help with this? So basically they will automatically apply QC multi rules and performance limits. So the Westguard rules, as you're probably more familiar with, um, it will actually alert, alert or reject any results that violate those QC multi rules or performance limits. And on top of that, it will generate a variety of charts allowing visual identification of trends. So things like your Levy Jennings plots, histogram plots, all of those things will be automatically uh, generated. And finally, in addition to this, it will give you access to peer group statistics, which as I mentioned, will greatly improve and assist with the troubleshooting process. So why peer group reporting? What's so um, important here and why can it uh, greatly benefit your lab? So first of all, what do we consider a peer group? A peer group comprises any group of laboratories that are using the same QC lot, but also most importantly, the same instrument, the same method. So we're comparing like for like, and it involves comparing your internal QC results with those other laboratories. And that might be globally, or it could be within your organization or laboratory network. 
Uh, both are possible with uh, peer group reporting packages. And finally, it will supplement your EQA by providing a real-time inter-laboratory comparison. So most EQA programs operate on a monthly, maybe a bi-weekly uh, basis. Uh, but really, with uh, data management packages, you can every day, real time, look at how you're comparing to other laboratories using the same QC, the same instrument, and the same method as you. So, based on how you perform and how you compare, you can troubleshoot and take steps to improve your performance. And the ultimate goal here is to increase the quality of the patient test results that you release and increase that confidence that you're releasing the correct results. Um, it will also help to improve your EQA performance. So, by taking any necessary corrective actions before the next challenge, you can ensure that your EQA performance or your proficiency testing performance will be within uh, the limits. Okay, so how else can a data management package help improve processes in the laboratory? One of the main things is improving efficiency. And labs globally are always under pressure to improve efficiency as best they can. Um, by implementing a proper QC data management package, um, you can actually save a lot of time and money, uh, basically by improving your analytical performance. And that's because any trends or system errors are identified as soon as possible, so quickly. Um, any um, false rejection rates are reduced. Um, you'll also see a reduction in repeat tests and the associated costs um, with those repeat tests, such as reagent costs, time, um, and also the additional QC costs. And as I've already mentioned, you will also hopefully see um, an improvement in your EQA and proficiency testing performance. Um, and how do we improve this um, efficiency? It's through the performance metrics and the QC statistics. So I already mentioned that QC packages will cover things like your standard deviation and your CV, but there are some more advanced metrics that will um, further help to improve laboratory efficiency. So we'll just look at a few of those this morning. So first up is total error, and Stephen also had a slide on total error earlier. It represents the overall, overall error due to both imprecision and inaccuracy. So it's looking at your bias and your re reproducibility as well. Um, it's used to define um, acceptable analytical performance, and it's compared to the total allowable error, which may be based on biological variation, CLIA, or really back, just depending on uh, where you are and what the regional requirements might be. So just to give you an example, uh, this table shows the biological or the total error based on biological variation for a number of different amino assay analytes. Um, just over on the far right hand side, I'll get my laser pointer. You can see here the limits due to both inaccuracy and imprecision um, for biological variation. And on the far right hand column, we have the total allowable error. So this is the percentage limit that um, you want to be within when it comes to total allowable error. And basically by driving to ensure that you're within those limits, you can improve your performance. Next up is measurement uncertainty, uh, which some of you will be aware of. It is a regulatory requirement for ISO 15189. Um, and basically it's the degree of error or the amount of error in your test system. So for every measurement, including clinical chemistry, immunoassay, whatever it may be, there's always a degree of uncertainty. And calculation of that uncertainty will give medical laboratories an estimate of the overall variability in the results they report. And it's important for a few reasons. So first of all, it's going to ensure that the measured results are useful. So the results that you produce in your lab are meaningful. Um, it will permit meaningful comparison with not only the medical decision limit, limits, but also previous results of the same kind in the same individual. And what we mean here is that we want to make sure that a change in a patient's test results is due to their clinical status and not due to a change or fluctuation in the test system. And finally, as I've already mentioned, it is a regulatory requirement. So ISO 15189, they will state that the lab shall determine measurement uncertainty for each measurement procedure in the examination phases used to report measured quantity values on patient samples. They go on to say that the lab shall define the performance requirements for the measurement uncertainty and regularly review, regularly review the estimates of measurement uncertainty. So, it is required that you not just calculate it once for each analyte, but that you do it regularly. And it's also required to do it at different concentrations as well, um, in particular at the medical decision limits. 
So since there is always a margin of error, we need to ask how big is that margin and how sure we are that the true value is within that margin. So what are the confidence levels? How confident are we that the result um, is close to the true value? And as I've mentioned, we should be calculating this for each analyte and for each level of control, especially at those medical decision limits. Okay, so the final metric I want to discuss this morning is Sigma metrics or Six Sigma. Um, again, most of you will have heard of this in the manufacturing industry um, and more and more it's becoming uh, widespread within the clinical laboratory um, industry as well. Um, it's a model of process improvement and the main focus is on minimizing variability in process output. So it's all about reducing variation, reducing defects and most importantly, improving the process efficiency. Um, so when we talk about variation in the lab, we want to make sure that it's kept an absolute minimum to ensure that the results released are as accurate and reliable as possible. And when we talk about defects in the laboratory context, we're talking about QC failures, so alerts and failures for your QC data. And finally, um, by improving and reducing those QC failure rates, we can improve uh, process efficiency and reduce costs and time associated as well. Okay, so the model works by calculating the number of standard deviations or the number of sigmas that fit within the quality specifications of the process. And those quality specifications are based on the total allowable error, which we've already discussed. And that might be biological variation, it might be CLIA, it could be the RICUS performance limits as well. So as the sources of error or variation are removed, the SD becomes smaller and so the sigma score increases. So the more standard deviations that you can fit within your process um, specifications, the higher the sigma score and the better the performance. So when we talk about sigma, we're really aiming for a sigma of six. And a six sigma test will produce approximately 3.4 defects per million events. So it is quite low. If we look, for example, at a smaller sigma score, so if we look at sigma of one um, in this column on the left hand side here, you can see that that results in 697,700 failed QC results per million tests. Um, and that number decreases uh, the higher the sigma score. You can actually get a sigma score higher than six, um, and this number would be less again but we're aiming for six, but generally um, anything above four is acceptable. Uh, Sigma metrics, um, not only can it be used to sort of give you an idea of how robust or how um, your process is working, um, it can also be help or used to help improve those processes. Um, and it does that by recommending QC rules or a QC frequency. Um, so as you know, most labs will already be implementing some sort of QC rules to accept or reject the results. But one of the main questions and one of the uh, questions I get asked all the time is how do we know if the QC rules are too strict or not, too, or not strict enough? So basically what rules do we need to apply? Um, and it's really not a one size fits all. We should be applying different rules based on the performance of the test and how robust the test is. Another question is how often you should actually run QC. Um, there's a fine balance between running enough QC and running too much QC where really um, the costs outweigh the benefit as well. And Six Sigma is a model that can be used to help streamline and determine what QC strategy um, is required. So it will help you to identify a set of QC multi rules and also a QC frequency based on previous test performance. Um, and that's really what we're looking at in this table here. So you can see um, a test that is operating with a sigma score of six, um, we need much less um, stringent rules and less QC frequency than a test that is maybe running at a sigma under four. So a sigma or a six sigma test um, requires QC once per day, and that would be for each level of QC. Um, and you can get away with quite uh, basic QC multi rules or West Guard rules. Um, in this instance, the one three S rule is recommended. However, if we just move on down the table to a sigma score of maybe three or two, um, then QC would be required at least four times per day. And again, that would be for each level of QC. And you can see here that a lot more uh, QC multi rules or West Guard rules are actually needed to control the performance of that test and improve the performance of that test. Um, so hopefully that gives you an idea of how you can use sigma metrics to sort of reduce costs and re um, improve efficiency in your lab. And as I said, the ultimate goal is to adjust your QC strategy 
adjust your QC frequency um, with the goal of improving your assay performance. Um, Six Sigma and Measurement Uncertainty are both included within the AccuSero 24-7 software, and this is something that was recently commended by Stan Westgard. He's a big advocate for um, Six Sigma and Sigma metrics, um, and he put a nice little post on LinkedIn just advocating the use of 24-7 for calculating those Sigma metrics. Okay, so for the last part of today's presentation, I want to introduce um, some tools or a solution to assist with your QC data management and the calculation of all of those performance metrics. Um, so AccuSera 24-7 is the Randox software. It's designed for use with our range of quality controls, our third-party quality control range. And it's just designed to make the QC review process that little bit easier, that little bit more convenient. Um, it means less time for yourselves um, having to review lots of different charts and lots of different reports. Um, one of the main features, and I'll show you live on the software, is our unique dashboard. And the dashboard is going to instantly flag any rule violations from the last seven days. So anything that has alerted or rejected one of the uh, performance limits or one of those QC multi rules will be instantly flagged for review. Um, and I mean, it just means less time reviewing reports and reviewing data. It's very convenient and very user friendly. The software is also going to provide access to peer group statistics. And these peer group statistics are uniquely updated live in real time. So unlike other software packages, um, there's no delay, um, everything's updated instantly in real time, um, and that just allows you to view your performance um, against that of your peer, so those using the same lot of QC and those using the same instrument as well. Um, there's lots of different charts and reports. Um, these charts and reports will provide an at-a-glance visual assessment of performance. Um, they're also interactive, which I'll show you um, as we walk through the software. Um, you can add lots of different um, data sets onto each of the charts um, for better review or analysis of any trends or bias in your test system. Um, it's also going to automatically calculate all of your QC statistics. So on top of your basic statistics, it will calculate the ones I've just showed you today, total error, measurement uncertainty, and sigma scores. Um, it's also a good platform for managing um, multiple laboratory sites from one location. So if you're part of a lab net network or you have satellite labs in your network, um, this software is ideal for um, checking how each lab is performing um, across the chain. Okay. Um, it's also highly flexible. Um, so it's designed to meet the needs of all laboratories, regardless of size, budget, um, all of those things. So, um, I'll show you some of the features as we go through the software, but you can set up your own custom multi rules, custom performance limits. Um, you can choose your peer group um, and how far, or how far you want to drill down for the peer group. Um, it really is very, very flexible. Um, it's also capable of connecting automatically to your LIS or your LIMS um, for automated data entry, which again just eliminates the need for manual data entry and making the process a little bit smoother and a little bit faster. It's a cloud-based solution, as we'll see in just a little bit. Um, so you log in simply via a website, um, and that ensures access from anywhere at any time, so from inside the lab, um, but also from outside the lab. And as I mentioned, it is designed for use with the Randox range of AccuSera controls. So um, a software is only as good as the controls that are supplied along with the software. Um, and it's important that a control is commutable, has clinically significant levels, and all of the things we know um, to be true for the AccuSera range. Okay, so now I want to uh, just talk you through some of the aspects of the software and touch on some of the points that I've just spoke about. As I said, it's a cloud-based online software, so simply you log in online with your username and password, and each member of staff within the laboratory can have their own unique username and password for traceability, for troubleshooting purposes. Um, so you'll see whenever you log in, you're presented with a series of tiles. Um, each tile or each icon represents a different part of the software. So all of your users will be within the user tab. And as I said, each person can have their own individual login details and um, just align full traceability. The first part of the software and probably um, the place I always recommend users to go to first is the dashboard. So as I said, the dashboard is a unique feature to 24-7, and automatically it's going to bring to your attention any QC failures, so any alerts or rejects from the last seven days. 
Um, you can see everything's quite clearly color coded as well, just for that added um, convenience. So anything that has been rejected is highlighted in red and any alerts um, are highlighted in orange. You'll also see in the table here, it gives you a brief overview of what test um, and what instrument has been affected and also what um, West Guard rule or what um, multi rule has been uh, violated in this instance. So if we look at alkaline phosphatase on the C311, you can see that it's the 4-1-S rule that has been broken here. And as a result, the software has um, alerted this. So what's quite nice about the dashboard is that you can, from here, go straight to your result history. So if I want to look at the performance of this analyte in a little bit more detail, I simply click on the analyte and it will bring me to the result history uh, view page. Um, depending on the number of results, it can take a little second to load. Um, so here we're looking for or looking at alkaline phosphatase. Um, you'll get a bit of information along the top um, just to let you identify which test has actually been affected. So it'll give you your method, uh, the units, uh, what instrument you're running it on, and then some overall information on the total allowable error and the allowable bias as well. All of the results um, or all of the reports within the software can be filtered. So here along the top, we have the date range. So I'm just going to keep it at the default date range, but you can select a date range that you want to view data for. It could be one day, one week, one month. It's completely up to the user. Um, there's also a few options um, in the drop down menu as well. So you can choose to filter um, so that you're looking at all results for that particular analyte. Um, however, you can also um, zoom in a little bit and look at just your rejected results or just your alerted results, for example. Um, so I'll keep it to alerted results. So you can see here along the top for each of my three levels of control, so we have the low, the normal and the high, um, we can quite clearly see the date the QC was run, the initials of the operator, again, um, very important for traceability and for troubleshooting, and um, the result that has been entered, and again, you can see it's color coded. So anything that has been alerted is highlighted in orange. And if we look at any rejects, they would be highlighted in red. Again, you can just click on the little arrow um, next to the date and it will give you more information on each of the three lots of control. So here it will tell you the SDI. Um, it will also tell you um, what rules were violated. So you can see here, that um, the re it was rejected based on the 13S and the 22S rules. And that's the same for each of the three lots of control. Okay. So below um, this top table here, we can zoom or scroll down to view our statistics. And here for each lot of control, we have um, our monthly and our cumulative statistics. So it'll give you a count, the mean, the standard deviation and the CV and then some of the performance metrics that we discussed in this morning's presentation. So we'll have the bias, um, and this is the bias compared to the peer group. Um, sigma score, total error, the interprecision, um, which is used to calculate the measurement uncertainty. And then we'll have uncertainty of measurement and also the expanded uncertainty of measurement. Um, and I'll show you some of these performance metrics throughout some of the other reports as well. So moving on from the result history, um, I'll just go back a step actually, so I can show you where you would be for all tests. Um, so I access the result history directly from the dashboard, but if you wanted to look at your result history for all tests, it's the little clock icon in the left menu. And you can see here that for all of my tests and all of my instruments, um, I can quickly and easily access the result history. This can also be filtered just by clicking on any of the column headings, just to make it a little bit easier to find um, the test. You can also use the search um, functionality at the top as well. Okay, so next I am going to show you how we would view performance on some of the charts. So again, it's just the little uh, bar chart icon in the left-hand menu. Uh, at the top here, we can select the chart that we want to see. So and the options are Lady Jennings, histograms, and performance summary charts. So first up, we'll look at the Lady Jennings. And I'm just gonna select one um, analyte for the purposes of this demonstration, but you could select multiple analytes to show on this chart as well. So let's double click on albumin. 
And again, you can select your date range. I'm just going to go with the default, um, which in this case is one year. Um, you can select your lots of control. So you can choose just to look at one level of control, or you can look at all three levels of control. Um, you can choose to combine the charts. So what we would be doing here is combining the results for all three levels at once. But I'll show you that in just a little bit. Um, again, the chart can be based on um, SDI or percentage deviation. And when based on SDI, you can choose um, whether to have a fixed or a variable legend along the sides. So I'm just going to keep it as default and generate the chart. Okay, so you can see we have quite a lot of data here. Um, as I said, we're looking at one year's worth of data. Um, at the minute, we're looking at the individual values, uh, but you can also choose to look at the main values, which will plot um, the lines on the chart accordingly. You can also um, zoom in just by clicking on the chart and uh, just to make it a little bit easier uh, to view what's going on. And as you can see, running themes throughout the software is that everything is highlighted just to make it a little bit more convenient and easier to spot those QC failures. So you can see here we have um, a QC failure highlighted in red. Um, and if you hover over that point, you'll get a little bit more information. So you can see the date that it was rejected. Um, you can see that the actual result was 24.6. The SDI was minus 2.2, and it was rejected because um, it broke the 2 SD rule. Again, if we click on any of our green points, these are our accepted points, you will get um, similar information. Okay, so just below, you can see each of your charts for each of the three levels of control. Um, and as I said, we just select the little combined slider to view all of those on the same chart. And um, it just makes it a little bit easier to spot if there's been a problem at perhaps a specific concentration. And again, I'm just going to zoom in just to like make it a little bit easier to view the data. So underneath the chart here, um, you can see the legend. So quite easily, you can add and remove different data sets um, just by turning off um, or graying out the ones you don't want to see. And again, you can turn those on by selecting them again. Um, again, by hovering over each of the points, you can see um, the date, the result, and the SDI. And in this case, we don't have any failures or rejects. Okay, so that's viewing different lots of control or different levels of control on a single chart. We can also view multiple analytes. So say we wanted to look at all of our albumin tests on a single chart, we would just go back out, select those and regenerate the, the Levy Jennings plot. Uh, just bearing in mind that the more information that you do add to a chart, the more difficult it can be to interpret. But again, you can always use the legend uh, to remove uh, the data sets that you no longer want to see. OK, so from there, we can keep the same criteria and view that data on the histogram. So this will generate a histogram based on the same three lots of control and the two different albumin tests. And again, you can see um, the legend below the chart lets you know exactly what you're viewing. So by hovering over um, each of the bars on the graph, again, you can see uh, the lot of control, the test, um, what instrument it was run on, the units. Um, you'll also see the number of results that fall within that SDI range. So for example, here, this blue bar, there was 133 uh, results that fell within the 0 to 0 0.5 um, SDI range. And really what we're looking for here is the nice bell curve that we're used to. So straight away, you can spot any outliers or maybe any uh, QC tests that need a little bit more attention and some troubleshooting. Again, you can zoom in um, just to make it a little bit easier to view uh, the data. Okay. And then the final chart is our performance summary chart. And again, this will um, auto-generate based on the data that we've already pre-selected. Pre so we're looking at three different levels of control um, for a few different albumin assays. And again, you can see that everything is color-coded um, on the chart. So what we're looking at here is your SDI and your CVI plotted onto the graph. And that's your SD compared to the peer group and your CV compared to the peer group. 
And ideally, you want to fall within the dark green section of the chart here, which is the desirable re region. The further away you are, um, the less acceptable the performance is. So here's quite a good example. All of our um, assays are within the desirable range. And again, you can see just by hovering over any of the points, you'll get the CV, um, the CVI and the SDI compared to the peer group. Um, just below the chart as well, you can see a breakdown of the statistics. So the laboratory's own um, statistics and that of the peer group as well. Okay, so that's our charts. Um, moving on then, I want to show you some of the reports and how you can use those reports to um, view some of the performance metrics that we spoke about and also some of the peer group data. So the first one is the statistical analysis report. And again, you can select the date range for what you want to see. Um, I'm just going to keep it at the default, which is looking at July and August. And here you can select your peer group. So I'm going to select the global peer group, which is the world. But as I mentioned, 24 seven can be used to view your performance in comparison to just your lab network or your lab group. Um, so you can choose group if you wish. And then you can choose to filter the data based on the test, the instrument or the method. So I'm going to group it by instrument and generate the chart. So here you can see um, grouped by each different instrument, all of the tests that are um, pre-populated or configured on this account. So the C311, we're looking at the albumin. In this section of the chart, we're looking at the participants um, overview. So your laboratory's overview and your laboratory statistics. And on the far right hand side, we're looking at the global peer group. So as I, as I said, I've already selected the peer group to be based on the global um, statistics. Okay, so here we're looking at data for the date range. So we've selected the 10th of July to the 10th of August, and we have some of our basic uh, QC parameters, basic QC uh, performance metrics. So we've got the mean, the standard deviation, and the CV. And then we've got the SDI and the CVI again compared to the peer group statistics. And then we've also got the same uh, for the cumulative count as well. So the mean, the SD, the CV, and again, the SD and CV compared to the peer group. And then you have the peer group stats to your right hand side um, just to show you how you compare. And again, this will be everyone using the same lot of control. Um, with all of the charts, the data can be exported. So Using the little icons at the top right, you can export to um, Excel file or PDF. Um, it just means the data can be printed and filed and kept for review. Okay, so the next um, report I want to show is the statistical metrics report. Um, again, it follows a very similar um, format to the statistical analysis report. Um, I'm gonna keep the default date range and I'm just going to change this so that we're filtering by instrument rather than assay. And again, generate the report. So whereas the previous report I showed you was looking at some of your uh, basic QC metrics, um, standard deviation and CV, this time we're looking at percentage bias, the CV, sigma scores and total error. So again, the lab's results are all based um, in the middle of the chart here or the middle of the report and the peer group data um, is on the right hand side. What's new on this report is the target values. So over here we have the total allowable error, which um, is defaulted to biological variation, but can be based on CLIA, the RICUS TDPA, or um, user-defined performance limits. Um, so you can see, um, you can compare your total error to the total allowable error um, quite quickly. Uh, this target is for your bias. So again, you can compare your percentage bias to the target um, and then your sigma scores are generated from there. So you can see quite a mix um, of some good sigma scores and some not so good sigma scores. And again, um, all of the data can be exported to Excel and uh, PDF and kept on file. Okay, um, skipping on then to the uncertainty of measurement report. Again, um, I'm just going to keep the default uh, date, but you can select any date range that you want to view um, the measurement uncertainty for. And I'm going to generate the chart. 
So you can see here you have a list of all of your assays. Again, you can filter any of these column headings just by clicking on um, the heading. Um, so I'm going to filter based on assay and remove the instrument. Okay, so for albumin here at the top, um, you can see the lot number of the control, the count, which is the number of um, results that have been run in this uh, time period. Um, you'll have your mean, your intra precision, your inter precision, and then from there, the software will automatically calculate uh, measurement uncertainty and the expanded measurement uncertainty as well. One thing to note here is that the software will automatically calculate your inter precision. And we've seen that on the result history screen, uh, which is represented by the little clock icon on the left. However, in order to calculate measurement uncertainty, the lab will need to manually enter their intra precision. So that's their within run precision. So what we would recommend is that they run a series of 20 uh, reps and then populate the intra precision into the software. And then from there, um, everything is done for you and calculated automatically. Um, and again, I should say that's for each um, lot of control and for each assay. So it complies with the ISO 15189 requirements. And like all the reports, um, it can quickly and easily be exported to Excel or PDF and kept on file. Okay, the final report I want to show you is the exception report. And again, I'm just going to generate based on the default time frame, but you can uh, select any time frame that's relevant to you. And what we're looking at here is for each assay um, and each instrument and each lot of control, we're looking at a count of the number of results that have been uh, performed or number of tests that have been performed during the time period selected. And it will group those into three brackets. So it will give you a percentage of results that are um, within two standard deviations. Those that are, that are between two and three standard deviations and those that are over three standard deviations. So you can quite quickly and easily get a count of um, any failures or anything that's outside those three standard deviation limits um, and any tests that maybe need to be uh, troubleshooted or the data looked at a little bit closer. Again, we can export to Excel or PDF and print uh, for regulatory purposes. Okay, so just skipping down uh, the menu a little bit um, to utilities. And I want to show you the Accusera advisor tool. So during the presentation, we spoke about Sigma metrics and how Sigma metrics can be used to improve your QC strategy design. Um, we actually incorporate a tool within the software that will help to do this as well. So again, for each of your tests, we can recommend a minimum QC frequency and a set of multi rules. Um, and again, this is based on the Sigma scores already calculated within the software. So in this case, um, for albumin, um, we're recommending that results that are greater than one two S are rejected. And the advised frequency is three times per day. So one level of control three times per day. And from here, we can automatically apply those rules by hitting the apply advised rules button um, and as I said that is recommend or that is uh, calculated for all parameters and all analytes within the software and um, there is a little um, bit of criteria that needs to be met before it will calculate and um, you need to set a performance limit so you need to set um, for example biological variation CLIA or the RICUS TDPA limits and you need to enter at least 30 results before it will calculate as well and um, so it goes on your previous performance history and recommends from there. Okay, um, just also within the utilities menu, we have our audit report. Um, the audit report is basically used to record um, all actions within the software. So anything relating to the addition, deletion or editing, editing of a QC test. Um, again, it's quite useful for printing off for regulatory purposes or for audit purposes. Um, and it can be based on the user, um, or you can filter it based on different categories. So for example, the um, assay or custom analytes instrument, for example, and date range. Um, obviously this report can get quite large depending on the number of data points uh, within the software. So the filters are quite useful for drilling down to see the specific information that you want. And then finally, just to finish, I want to show you some of the data entry options that are available. 
So as I said, automated data entry is available with the software. Um, on top of that, there's a few options as well. So we have our manual data entry, which would involve um, manually inputting the results from the analyzer. And this can be done based on the individual QC test, or you can create a panel of related tests and enter results for those um, panels. So for example, a clinical chemistry panel, immunoassay panel, etc., and that will help to speed up the um, manual data entry process a little bit. But the main one I want to show you is our EDI. So EDI is just a form of semi-automated data input. It stands for electronic data input. Um, and basically, if we can get a QC file from the instrument or from the limb, so an Excel file or a CMV, CSV file containing the QC results, we can just simply import it into the software. Um, it's basically like attaching an email or attaching a document to an email. Um, it does require um, some mapping and configuration to be carried out in the first instance. But once we've mapped it and configured it, um, we simply just need to import the file. And from there, all of the results will be populated into the software and can be viewed in the result history section. Um, and that's really the main parts of the software um, that you can use to show GC failures, monitor any trends or bias within the software. And the one thing to note here is that the same software is used for our Accusera Verify uh, product range as well, so our calibration verification range. So again, it's one user-friendly platform that can be used for all of your internal QC data management.